about this this week we're going to end like one of the last things I'm going to be talking about is the Father's heart today I'm going to move into a, a teaching called the ever increasing kingdom the ever increasing kingdom and it's coming from the heart of God is, is continually releasing revelation to us that is growing us up from, from small children to true sons and daughters to fathers and mothers of others. Paul wrote 1 Corinthians 13, When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child. When I, came, when I became a man... I did away with childish things. When I look back at my walk, at 22 years old when I surrendered to the Lord and had an encounter with Him, there was a lot of things that, that I had picked up over the years that formed an image of who God was. The way I approached the Word, my bits and pieces formed an image of who I thought God was. But in His goodness, He put me on a journey and He began to grow me up. Most of what I thought when I was 22 years old, I don't think anymore. The understanding has matured. It has gone deeper. It has produced a deeper work in my life. So I can identify with what Paul said. When I was a child in the Lord, I thought one way. But... As His revelation increased in my life, it began to change my understanding. And I began to know who He was more. And allow His life to, to be lived through my life. I'm saying this because so many times in our walk, at certain ages, if you will, in our walk, we come to think, I know this. And then we'd say, I know this. But then... Years pass and growth takes place and what we thought we knew, now we want to lay away. And what I want you to understand is it's okay to do that. What's wrong is when we take something and an understanding that we had, say, at age 10 and now we're 25 in the Lord and that understanding has matured but we won't let go of something that we previously held on to. That's when the word or a doctrine shifts into an idol. Many times people go to a church and the idol of the church is the Bible. The Bible becomes an idol to some people because it has overtaken a walk in the Spirit of God because of this belief or that belief. So what I'm going to say, that's a harsh way of putting it, but understand when God is wanting to mature you from stage to stage in your Christian walk. Orthodox things, the virgin birth, the deity of Jesus, His bodily death, burial, resurrection, His coming back, those things are solid. We're not turning loose of those things. But other things... We need to be able to evaluate at different points of maturity in our life and become okay with that. <coughs> Insecurity will cause us to look at one thing and not turn loose of it because we have to admit that our understanding was bad. But security in the Father's heart understands that God is taking us in an ever-increasing journey. And today, I walk in a greater revelation than I did 15 years ago. So some of the conclusions that I had at that point, I need to let go. Because He has made me more mature. Some of these scriptures we've gone over, but I'm going to, going to bring them out again. Matthew 13, 31. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed which a man took and sowed in his field. And this is the smaller than all other seeds. But when it's full grown, it is larger than the garden plants and becomes a tree. 
so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. This is the revelation of the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. Those are interchangeable. But it's speaking about the process that God takes us through and the process of time. That plant doesn't just fully grow one day, overnight. It is the process of time. It is the process of enduring. And the enduring walk that we have with the Lord causes us to grow stronger. Causes us to go deeper with our root system. Deeper today than we were yesterday. And that's what ever increasing is talking about. And this is talking about the kingdom. That the kingdom is ever expanding. It is ever growing. But not just in geography. In maturity in our own lives. So I'm talking about the kingdom and its growth. But I want to bring it back to our personal lives and growth. He spoke another parable to them. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid three pecks of flour until it was all leaven. When you take that, you begin to mix it together. It can't become separate again. And it's mixed, and it's mixed, and it's mixed. That's how the kingdom works in our lives. When we receive revelation from God, we begin to walk this thing out. We receive it, we have a portion but truth is revealed again and again to us and it begins to grow in our lives. It begins to expand in our lives. And that's why some areas we can live really, really strong in God and have a mature walk, but then in another area, we're still a child. That's how the kingdom works. It is growing and it is expanding. That's why it's dangerous to look at one person and compare your life with that person in a comparative standpoint. As, as if you're looking for value and worth in comparing yourself. But you can look at people as mentors and say they have this area of understanding down and I can learn from them in this area of my life. So God has us on a personal walk that is maturing through the process and time that He takes us. We'll give you several scriptures to, to begin this foundation. Isaiah chapter 9, 6, and 7. We hear this every, every Christmas. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. We know this is a prophetic word from the prophet concerning Jesus. But look at verse 7. There will be no end to the increase of of His government. No end to the increase of His government. That says when His kingdom comes and it has came, it will continue to expand and that expansion will not stop. It's going to continue to grow. So when you think about Jesus saying the kingdom of God is within you, it comes to you in one revelation. That Jesus is the Son of God. That He died on the cross. He was buried. He rose again. And that salvation moment comes into your life. But it comes in seed form. And it begins to increase. Its government influence in your personal life begins to increase. That increase causes tension. You have revelation of how to walk, but you've not yet trained yourself in how to walk. So that's what the increase of His government in our personal life looks like. And it's the same outside. Another scripture. Proverbs chapter 4 verse 18. This is making it personal. But the path of the righteous is like the dawn that shines brighter and brighter until the full day. That's what Jesus told His disciples when He said, I have many things to teach you but you're not able to bear them now. But when He goes away, He'll send the Holy Spirit who will lead us in all truth and righteousness. That's what this is talking about. Shining brighter and brighter until the fullness comes. Until you see the full revelation of what Jesus died for. That's why some have only the message of the cross. And that's the entry message. But they've not stepped on to these other messages. We don't leave that message, but we continue to grow and build on that foundational message. But it's not devaluing the foundation to build a house on it. 
is actually fulfilling the purpose of the foundation, which was to hold the house. A couple more scriptures here. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. But whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. This is talking about the law. Now the, Spirit, now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with an unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. There is a principle there. The thing that you behold is the thing that you become. What you identify with, what you look at, what you feed yourself with, you begin to align your life's purpose with that. Your teachings begin to sound similar. That's why it's so crucial when we make decisions on what we're going to, to allow to influence our life. But he's saying, we behold the Lord. We're looking unto the Lord. We're being transformed into His image. That's talking about the things that He did. How He spoke. How He walked upon the earth. Our lives begin to conform to that. And as we look at Him, there's that constant invitation that's saying, become more like me. Become more like me. And that's what Revelation does. When you, when you have just a a bit of truth that just comes into your spirit. And that seed form, and you begin to think on that. You begin to, to ponder that. You begin to write on that. You start to research a little bit about that. And you develop that truth. And then you start to apply it in your life. That's how we're changed. One of the reasons we record all of our messages, because I go back and listen to them. Because a lot of times I'll have a, a release of revelation while I'm speaking. And, I, and I'm thinking in my mind, I've not said that before. And then I'll go back and I'll take that and I'll start looking at Scripture. And that truth will begin to open up a whole new area, a whole new dimension that I previously didn't have understanding in. And that's what happens when the seed of the kingdom comes in. When you honor it, you give place to it, it begins to grow and expand in your life. That's what he's talking about. Beholding the Lord and being transformed into His image from glory to glory. Mark 16, verse 19. So then when the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, this is after His resurrection, He was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. Look at this next verse in Hebrews 10. But when the priest had offered for all time, one sacrifice for sin. This is talking about Jesus. He sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, He waits for His enemies to be made His footstool. There is a lot of revelation that is 100% important in how you apply this in your life. If you're going to walk out of here with anything today, I want you to get this. This removes the mindset of we're just saved and we're just waiting to be taken out of here before it all goes to hell. Before it all turns out really bad for those around us. It says when Jesus sat down at the right hand of God, since that time, He's been waiting. He's been waiting for His enemies to be made His footstool. That's the result. His enemies to be put under His feet. But how does that happen? It doesn't happen with us waiting too. It happens through us as co-laborers of Christ. When Jesus ascended to heaven and He released gifts unto people, the fivefold ministry, those gifts were in essence the mantle and the anointing that was on His life. He distributed those to leaders in the body which in turn receive those gifts and they equip every believer to walk this out in making the enemies of Jesus His footstool. That's what we are called to do. Remember the Scripture that the God of heaven will soon crush Satan under our feet. He does that through the believers, through you and I. So when Jesus went to the right hand and sat down, He's been waiting for His enemies to be made His footstool. We'll go deeper in that. 1 Corinthians 15, 
24. This is when he's been talking about the, the final resurrection. In 24 he says, Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. This is talking about when Jesus, the end will come when Jesus hands the kingdom to his Father after all dominion, authority, and power have been put under his feet. Verse 25 says, For he must reign until he has put all of his enemies under his feet. And the last enemy to be destroyed is death. So I want you to think what enemies operate in your life or in your circle of influence. When you want to discover your calling, you, you begin to look around and you say, what is God the Father wanting to take place in my life and in my immediate circle of influence? And you begin to identify the enemies. When you begin to, begin to identify the enemies, you can see where the Father is already working. He is working through you to put those enemies under the feet of Jesus. When we start thinking about what's my purpose, what's my calling, that's it. Now you will refine that purpose and define that purpose. But this is where it all begins. When you're able to look at your life, your immediate area of influence, and say that is an enemy of Jesus. This item, this activity, whatever this is, this way of thinking is an enemy of Jesus and you begin to invite Him to cause you to put it under your feet. That's walking in kingdom purpose. And how the kingdom expands is when each believer starts to do that. And then it becomes a corporate anointing. A corporate anointing which you have multiple people operating, putting the enemies of Jesus under His feet. Because that's what he's been waiting for. The Great Restoration Movement. I want to show you this on a larger scale. And this was the Protestant Reformation. So we know the Catholic Church had emerged and had literally taken over much of the known world. Martin Luther was a priest in the Catholic Church. And he was so convicted to get rid of his sin. And as he was praying, I'm making a long story short, he went away to school, he began studying Scriptures, people got fed up with him, said, just go to the Scriptures. So he was at the Scriptures. And he had a revelation of grace and faith in his life, and he was born again. He was wanting more. So that began a reformation in the church. All that was known at this point primarily was the Catholic Church. At this point, no person had Scripture. Scripture wasn't available in the common man's language. So all they had was the priest to stand up in front of them and tell them what to do. But the priest would only speak in Latin. So there was no instruction being given to the common person. Scripture was withheld for the select few. The doctrine, one of the doctrines was that the traditions of the church was equivalent to Scripture. So it wouldn't matter if they teach you just a tradition or a Scripture. It was to keep the, isol the common man isolated. So this became known as the Dark Ages. If you were caught with a portion of Scripture, you could be put to death. At this time, the Pope was called the most divine of all heads. And there were several other, unctioned by Christ, the anointed one. Okay, He stepped into the place of Jesus. And at His decree, the people believed He could curse people or release them from purgatory. So everything was controlled by this man and this system. So imagine you had no instruction. You were only told what, what they wanted you to know. So Martin Luther receives this revelation as he's crying out to God, receives forgiveness of sin. He turns to the Scripture and he wants the people to become equipped. So he wrote these 95 statements and he put them on the door of the church. When you put things on the door of the church, that was commonplace in that day to say you want to debate these items. So he said, I want to debate these 95 statements. And what happened, that was the sparking of a revolution that you and I are part of. 
Because we're considered Protestant. It means we protested against that system of religion. That began a period of acceleration. For 1,500 years, the church had peaked out, dropped down, and was in this system. So about 1,500, that was when that happened. Scripture began to be translated into the common person's language. One of the primary things that Martin Luther began to teach was the priesthood of all believers. Saying that, that every person is a priest. Every person can approach God themselves through Jesus. That they didn't have to go through the, the, the ordained priest of the day. So in essence, he was trying to give back ministry to the people. To equip the people. But this was in seed form. This was 500 years ago. That's not that long ago. 1 Peter chapter 2. It says, Coming to Him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus. Saying that you are a priesthood. When Martin Luther began speaking this, that was worthy of death. To tell people you are a priesthood would get a person killed at that time. But these words were powerful. These words were Scripture. This is something that we are moving into farther in our day, in our time. We are much farther along today than we were when Martin Luther began teaching this. This teaching has matured into what does this look like for us today? How is this walked out for us today? I'm going to give you five things to help you see where you're at in this walking out of becoming a priest. Before I go there, Martin Luther started the Reformation. About a hundred years later, there was a strong evangelical movement where people went out preaching that you can be saved by grace, not by the works of the church. So that went out about a hundred years later. Another hundred years later, there was a holiness movement that began sweeping because people were truly getting born again and they were beginning to walk by the Holy Spirit and their lives were beginning to be cleaned up. So that lasted another 150 to 200 years. In the 1900s, we had the Pentecostal movement, the outpouring of the Spirit of God. Today is the fastest growing segment of religion globally. Of religion globally is the charismatic movement. Those who are being filled with the Spirit. That is taking us somewhere. In the last hundred years, we've seen the restoration of pastors, of evangelists, of teachers, of apostles and prophets. When all of those began working together, which the restoration of the apostles started to be accepted around 1990. But you can, when you draw back and look at this whole picture, you can see since the Reformation, there's been an acceleration in understanding of truth coming back into the body of Christ. So the next thing on the agenda, I believe, is the deeper manifestation of the priesthood of every person that is a Christian. Bill Hammond has called it the day of the saints. When the ordinary person walks by the Spirit of God and is able to release the Kingdom of God wherever they're at. Wherever they're at. That's the maturing of understanding every person is a priesthood. Five things. Every person is found in five realms. One is, is the world realm. That's just un, unborn again people. Unregenerated man. That's the starting place of all of us. When we're born again, we enter into what we could call, just for understanding's sake, the church realm. This is where most of the believers we know live at. This is a place where people are taught the basics of Christianity. It's where they're baptized, fellowship, communion. They're starting to understand the gospel message at a deeper level. That's where most people live. Many people stay in that place. 
Even many Pentecostals, most Pentecostals, now are living in that place. But the next is the supernatural realm. This is when the people in the church begin to realize there is more than what they are walking in. It is a constant state of mind for every person that's entering into the supernatural to understand where I'm at may be a good place, but there's more. And even next year, wherever I'm at, it may be a good place, but there's more. Because when we begin to touch the supernatural, the aspects of the kingdom, we're beginning to touch that. We're beginning to break through and let the kingdom come in. And healings take place. Deliverances take place. Demons are, are crying out, leaving people. The dead's being raised. When we begin to touch those aspects, it shifts our life into a massive transition. We just had a massive transition coming out of the world into the church. And we thought we arrived. But then there was a hunger that was born for more. That I can't just do what I've been doing. I want more. No matter... I was reading some writings that, that put out, said for about every ten years the person has been in church... It takes about one year for them to transition into the supernatural once they begin to touch it. So if you've been in a church 20 years, it's about a two-year transition. And, and that was accurate for me. When I began, I understood some stuff, but when I began to get a hold that the supernatural was not just every once in a while, but it could become normal, it was about a two-year of what I call a detox to come out of that religious system to begin to be freer, to move in these things. And that's when the supernatural becomes a normal part of your life. But much of it's still existing in the church. Because we're touching the supernatural and we're bringing it into that area where we're comfortable. So it's in the church. But we begin to move into a kingdom realm after that. It's a progressive way of thinking. Remember we talked about of the increase of His government, there would be no end. The leaven that's worked through the whole lump, the whole loaf. So we begin to transition into a kingdom realm. This is when we begin to move outside of the church with the supernatural. So we're going to take this where we go. We're, we're going to be as comfortable in the supernatural in our job as we are in the church. We're going to be as comfortable in the supernatural at the grocery store as we are in church. We we'll begin to shift majorly our way of thinking to where it's not just get people in the church, but it's to take the supernatural lifestyle out. It's a kingdom mindset. It looks at things on the outside and says, I want to see transformation in this area. Not just geographically, in this system, in the government, the education. This is the seven mountains. But we begin to understand that there's a kingdom realm that exists beyond the church house walls. And then there's the new covenant realm. This is when we really start to see complete way of thinking has changed. This is what, what it all falls under. Because we've been, been getting aspects of the kingdom in this area. And then in this area we get another revelation. In this area we get another revelation. And these have almost fell independently of each other. But when we begin to say, this is falling under something greater. This is falling under something greater. This area is falling something under, under something greater. We understand the new covenant banner that's beginning to, to live out around our lives. We understand that church is new covenant. That kingdom is new covenant. It's all under the banner of the new covenant. And we start to get understanding. All of this does move together. It's not independent aspects of our life. Healing flows out of the kingdom understanding. But the kingdom understanding flows by understanding the new covenant. So it all begins to just mix in together. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 6. He has made us competent as ministers of the new covenant. We're not church house ministers. We're not kingdom ministers. 
were ministers of the new covenant. Not of the letter, but by the Spirit. That's when you we, we read the Scripture, but we understand how it's walked out by the Spirit of God. It's not I'm reading this and I'm overlaying it over your life and saying, do you line up or not? That's not New Covenant. That's Old Covenant. New Covenant, you read that Scripture and you see it as an invitation for the person to come to the next place of revelation. And it's not a condemning, saying, you're missed this, this is an X. It's no, this is the next place for you. Many times, people of the supernatural, we are touching the world and we're identifying what's out of alignment and saying, okay, God wants to heal that. That is absolutely true. But we're wanting to release the power and fix the problem. But many times we leave out the love that's revealed in the new covenant by which that power flows through. So the person sometimes may feel an object of your faith. It's not that it's wrong, it's just that it's immature in some areas. For years when I moved in deliverance, for two years practically every week, I was casting demons out. Every week. We were meeting with people all over this region. And one day the Lord broke me on the inside. Because I understood that I liked the power encounter more than I loved the person which I was to be ministering to. That the encounter, the engagement of the war made me feel like I was valued because I could walk in power and I was absent the love that's revealed through the new covenant. And the Lord spoke to me. I wrote it down. It's on some pages that I wrote out in 2004. The Lord said, when you, you can move in my gifts when you learn to love the person. Now, that's a paraphrase of it. But in essence, I was thinking, but I am moving. I think I was just touching them. I wasn't able to flow with them. It was, I wanted that power encounter to feed an insecurity in me and find value. But in the new covenant, it just kind of falls away. Because now we're motivated. Our motivation as ministers of the new covenant is the compassion to see the people of God step into their destiny. And the power encounter is not even a relevant part of it. When we move into supernatural healing, deliverance, things like that, it's real easy to want to see the kingdom be manifest. But sometimes we want to see the kingdom manifest so we can get a check mark, I manifested the kingdom. And then I get to testify about it. And i got to write this testimony out so I can tell everybody. That's a place we all walk through. But we don't want to stay there. We want to understand that. We want to continue to cause the kingdom to manifest through faith. But we, we want to say, Lord, but let it be bathed in love and compassion. Because the Scripture says, Jesus moved with compassion and healed them. So we want to walk in that same aspect. Not just get a check mark or testimony. That's, that's our entry level. We're all going to go through that. Nobody I know that is moving and things like this skipped that part. Because when we first start to really taste it, we want that. Because it is almost a validation of what we've been saying is right. But when we understand truth is truth, we don't have to have that validation. Especially when what we're doing is bathed in love for others. So in this new covenant, when we begin to, to step into this new covenant realm, we can actually...